Okay, so hello everybody and welcome, welcome to um, the webinar today, strengthening regional collaboration and cooperation through higher education programs, um, Afghanistan and Thailand. Um, so we are joined here today. Um, we're coming from a number of different locations, but we'll wait for a few more minutes before we do a brief introduction. Um, we'll wait for a few more participants. So if you um, can post uh, your name and where you're coming from in the chat, um, welcome everybody and thank you for being here with us today. It's a great, um, great honor to have all, the, all of our speakers here. We'll introduce, uh, we'll introduce them shortly, but um, we'd love to get a sense from you, the participants as well, where you're coming from. So um, Saul, perhaps if you could enable the chat, I think the function actually at the moment isn't available, it looks like. So as soon as we get the chat open, um, if you'd like to say a quick hello and introduce yourself. Everyone can chat. Is it working? Is it? Yes, it's, it's working. Open. Excellent, great. Thank you so much. So welcome everybody. Um, so I think we'll go ahead as we're a few minutes um, late, delayed in starting. Um, and thanks, thanks again for being here uh, with us today for the second webinar in a series of webinars that we are um, hosting, um, uh, supported by the Hollings Center. Um, this webinar is titled The Role of Higher Education Institutions in Increasing Access to Education and Training, Collaborative Learning and Multi-Stakeholder Engagement in Afghanistan. And we'll follow a slightly different um, format as we did in the first webinar, this webinar, um, I'm, if you had joined us the last webinar, we had a series of excellent speakers, um, but we had really hoped that there would be more time for dialogue at the end. So what we've done in this webinar is um, uh, allocated a certain amount of time for our speakers and a large portion to the second part, which will be a dialogue session um, towards the, the second half of the webinar, which we, we invite you to participate in. And we are really looking forward to hearing from you, the attendees, the speakers, and having a really, um, really fruitful dialogue um, here on, on how we can support um, higher education efforts and social business efforts in, in Afghanistan. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping. My name is Aoife Franklin. I will be your host for the webinar today. Um, I guess when we move into the second portion, I'll explain a little bit more about how the dialogue will function. And um, But uh, at the moment, um, I think we will start uh, ahead with our, with our opening um, remarks. So I would like to, I would like to hand over to Dr. Faiz Shah, who is the director of the UNIS Center at the A AIT in Thailand, Asia Institute of Technology in Thailand. Um, and he will tell us a little bit about um, the webinar and, and, introduce, um, and introduce why we are here today. So thanks over to you, Dr. Feis. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Well, good evening. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be part of this program. And uh, at the very outset, I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, partners in this uh, endeavor, the Sustainable Smiles, uh, which we've worked with now for a number of years, and the Holling Center, which uh, allows us to reach out to all of you. This, this program, of course, is about uh, building partnerships for higher education uh, between uh, Thailand, where we are based, and uh, Afghanistan, of course, which has a diaspora that uh, perhaps has uh, a very strong need to uh, connect to educational opportunities all over the world. Uh, it's also my pleasure to welcome our guests uh, from Afghanistan, uh, eminent people, heading ministries uh, for women and education and our very own Dr. Mahibi. Uh, the, uh, I would say that the real purpose for uh, this uh, the seminar is to engage in a constructive outcome-driven debate. But I would like to very quickly uh, describe the UNIS Master's Program as well, because that's where uh, all this action is going to take place. This program is a master's program, of course. It's a professional master's, and it was uh, inspired by Professor Muhammad Yunus himself, who actually drew the outline for this program. So we felt that uh, for a lot of entrepreneurship programs uh, lacked uh, in a number of uh, very important areas. So this program combines um, a very strong 
uh, academic component because we understand the need for grounding uh, students in good academic robustness. Uh, so they take courses from the School of Management and School of Development of each. And then uh, there's also a very strong practical component where students are able to uh, uh, practice a lot of the stuff that they actually learn in class. And uh, Dr. Franklin will perhaps unpack that a bit more with, with more detail. But the idea is that every student coming through the UNIS Masters uh, leaves with a robust practical business plan that they can actually either take to uh, an investor or uh, find uh, resources to implement uh, without having to uh, really find out how this will work. So, so I think the, the context for this workshop is uh, rooted in this opportunity of providing Afghan students an international education, but also rooted in this idea of a practical education where they get an academic credential that is much more than the sum of its parts. So uh, welcome to this program. I hope this is by invitation. So we know that people who are in this program have a stake in it, a stake uh, in its success. And so I'd like to welcome you all to this program and uh, back to AFA for lead leading us into this, uh, hopefully a very constructive discussion. Welcome again. Thank you, Dr. Faiz, um, and thank you for, for putting it in, in context. I think it's a very um, unique opportunity for Afghan students and professionals to avail of, of this, this program, and it's it comes at such a crucial time um, in Afghanistan right now, where we need those empowering opportunities for people who, you know, they have the passion, they have the ideas, um, and they, you know, the ideas that can really benefit and support their communities and further their work. So um, thank you. This has been an amazing collaboration between Sustainable Smiles and, and, um, and the AIT Center, and so this webinar series supported by the Holling Center. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that um, intro. And I'll pass over to Dr. Kelly Franklin now to tell us a little bit more about the program itself. And we will hear also um, a recorded um, video from Dr. Um, Professor uh, Mohammed Yunus um, uh, about the program. So over to you, Kelly. Thank you, Aoife. Uh, we just want to emphasize, too, that we are very excited to have this opportunity to discuss ways that we can collaborate to help strengthen support for Afghan students. And I um, want to also mention that we're very honored to have our keynote speakers and all of you with us today to share your perspectives and your responsive approaches towards assuring that Afghan students not only have access to education, but that their access to education is transformative and empowering. So I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to share briefly with you um, and extend on what Dr. Feist had presented about our master's program in social business and entrepreneurship at the UNIS Center AIT in Thailand. And one of the aims of our program is really to redirect our students from the traditional path of hunting for jobs to one of creating jobs for themselves and others to entrepreneurship and social business. And our aim, as Dr. Feist mentioned, is really inspired inspired by Nobel laureate Professor Mohammed Yunus, who is behind the helm of our program and who has demonstrated the power of social business to lift people out of poverty and address some of the most pressing development and environmental needs in times of crisis. And a unique aspect of our program is that our curriculum engages our students in real life learning through social business assignments, a service learning course, and through developing a social business model. So for example, our students will work in teams to research, design, and implement a social impact project in Afghanistan. And so th through this, they'll learn how to innovatively coordinate projects remotely and build partnerships through our global network and with local communities and partners on the ground in Afghanistan. And our team has identified four leverage points based on some of the pressing development needs currently in Afghanistan that our students will center their projects on. And these leverage points are education, improving women's access to technology and science, energy and water, and localized sustainable food systems. So to help us inform our curriculum design around these four areas, we're hosting these webinars. And today we'll be learning from you on ways that we can collaborate to increase Afghan students' access to education and training, both for secondary and higher education. And we'll be taking um, your expertise to also help us inform our curriculum design. 
So I'd like to now share a brief video from Professor Unix explaining the power of social business to further highlight what our program has to offer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, everybody knows what a business is. Business is to make money. So that's what uh, we go into business to make money. Uh, but social business is different. You don't go into business to make money. You, do, you go into business to solve problems without having any intention of personally benefiting from it. So it has a kind of a different direction from a conventional business. Conventional business is profit-centric. You're looking for opportunity where you get the maximum profit out of it. So it's always a kind of a sensing where the money is. But here in social business, you're looking at a problem problem that we are familiar with, problem of poverty, problem of unemployment, problem of environment, you name it. Pick one problem and come up with a business idea how to solve that problem and remove any intention of making personal money out of it. That becomes social business. We define it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. So the critical point is non-dividend, that we don't want any to turn out of it personally. Company makes profit, that's what it makes it a business. A profit in a sense to become sustainable so that it can run by itself, it's not dependent on charity. So it's a sustainable business, but the profit that is generated is not taken out by the owner of the company. Owner of the company can take back the investment money, whatever money he or she has invested in it. Uh, gradually, he or she can recover that money, but after that, he doesn't want any money out of it because his whole company is dedicated to solving problems. And that's what makes it social business. So this is how it works. And we created a lot of those social businesses because when we see problems, you kind of get overwhelmed. How do you solve all these problems? Only way the world has ever seen solving this problem is through charity. That's the only way you can do that. Because in business, you don't do that. In business, you're so busy making money. You have no time to think about solving other people's problems. So that's where the philanthropy comes in. Philanthropy, in philanthropy, you give away your money so that the money goes out, does a wonderful job in solving people's problems. But the limitation of charity is money goes out, does the work, solves the problem, but the money doesn't come back. It's a one-time use of the money. But if you can put it in a business format, you put the objective of the philanthropy, put a business engine behind it. So it becomes a social business where you send the money out, get the problem solved, and money comes back. So you can reuse the money again and again and again, endlessly. So it becomes very powerful money. So social business money has endless life, whereas philanthropy money has only one life. That makes it all the difference. So this is where the difference between this philanthropy and the social business and conventional business. Thank you, uh, Kelly, and thank you, um, Professor Muhammad Yunus, for those words. Um, I think it gives a good context for the type of um, the type of education that we really need nowadays um, in the world. That those really proactive, um, practical ways that we can apply our education into solving real world problems in a really empowering way. Um, so. Thank you for that. Um, so I would like to now introduce um, our, our three speakers and um, thank you very much to our speakers for being with us today. And our first speaker um, is Dr. Fred Hayward, um, who is a retired senior higher education consultant um, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and Dr. Hayward is a specialist in higher education with more than 25 years of experience as an educator, scholar, and senior administrator and higher education consultant. And he has a PhD from Princeton University and a BA from the University of California. Um, he's taught at the University of Ghana, Foray Bay College in Sierra Leone, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he was Professor of Political Science, Department Chair, and Dean of International Programs. Um, he was an Executive Vice President of the Council on Higher Education Accreditation and Senior Associate for the American Council on Education for more than 10 years. He's been a higher education um, consultant for the World Bank, Carnegie Corporation, 
the Ford Foundation Academy for Educational Development, AED, uh, USAID, Ministries of Education and Universities focusing on higher education change, governance, strategic planning and accreditation. And Dr. Hayward has written extensively on development issues in, and higher education and has worked in Afghanistan on many occasions, uh, beginning in 2003 with the Higher Education Sector Review for AED and the World Bank, um, in 2006, 2005 to 2006 for the World Bank, helping six universities carry out strategic plans, and from January 2009 through December 2010 with the, uh, the AED Higher Education Project run by the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, that was working with the Ministry of Higher Education on the National Higher Education Strategic Plan from 2010 to 2014, um, quality assurance and accreditation and serving on several ministry um, commissions. Um, so Dr. Fred um, Hayward, thank you so much for being with us here today. What an extensive career you've had and it's just amazing to see um, you know how how long you've been um, on the journey with Afghanistan since 2003 so it's wonderful to have you um, in the room today and I believe you will be speaking to us um, about what nations can do to help improve um, equality in Afghanistan so we really appreciate you being here um, and thank you for for joining us. Thank you can you hear me all right? You can okay great uh, I'm delighted to be here I'm going to draw on a paper that the former Deputy Minister Usman Babri and I have started to write, in which we have looked at both the current situation in Afghanistan uh, and what can be done to get higher education and secondary education open again to all who want to go, especially to women. Uh, as all of you, I think, are well aware, the situation in Afghanistan, especially for women, uh, is terrible and has gotten even worse in the last week. Not only have they cut women off from secondary and tertiary education, uh, but they've not allowed them to work with NGOs. And uh, this week or last week, they decided they couldn't work for the UN either. Uh, and uh, you can't leave the house without a male escort. It can be a three-year-old boy, but they have to have an escort. I have a number of women who worked for me. I was, was there for eight years, uh, off and on, first for the World Bank, and then later this project that run through AID from the University of uh, at Massachusetts at Amherst. And what I want to start out by saying is that uh, by the time I left a few years ago, we had made phenomenal progress in higher education. We'd gone from, um, let me look at my number here. We had gone from uh, 22 public universities, uh, or, or grown to 22 public universities from about 13 and 29 private universities. In addition, there were higher education institutions, public and private, uh, and uh, two community colleges, one uh, in medicine and one in computer science, uh, based on the, on the recognition that you didn't need a full bachelor's degree to be in a, a medical assistant. And there was a shortage of, of, of people, especially women uh, in, in that category. Uh, there had been one exception at the university level, and that was for women doctors, since the Taliban didn't want men looking at their wives uh, or their daughters. And there were about 200 women who had been trained during the first uh, Taliban period uh, in, in medicine and a few women nurses, although not nearly enough. But that in itself made a tremendous difference in infant mortality and maternal mortality. Uh, Afghanistan had been at the bottom of the list in terms of women and children dying, along with Sierra Leone, another place where I've worked. Um, we worked diligently to improve the quality of higher education. Uh, we required uh, every uh, area to update uh, their programs. And 
And the irony is that at one point uh, before the Russian invasion, Afghanistan had, had some of the best universities in that part of the world. Kabul University uh, received students from all over the Middle East and, and Asia. Um, but you know, with the Taliban the first time around, things got bad for, uh, and women were not allowed in higher education. So we moved from virtually no women in higher education when I first got there uh, to about, uh, I think it was 30% by the time I left a few years ago. And this was very hard. We, we were, the deputy minister and I were attacked uh, one day in uh, the ministry by a group from the UN wondering why we didn't have 50% women in higher education. And we pointed out the fact that there were no women in secondary education or, uh, you know, who, who was going to pass the exam, the entrance exam. About 250 did pass the entrance exam. And these were women who had gotten their secondary education either in Pakistan or Iran or a few other foreign countries. Um, what we've been trying to do in this paper we're working on is to think about ways to improve the situation for women without being confrontational. As I'm sure you're all aware, there have been lots of things written, including one piece by me, uh, and my criticism was primarily of the Biden administration, failure to plan for the evacuation of people who, who we and other allies had promised a uh, safe passage out if things became grim. Uh, but most of the other things are, are attacking the Taliban with good reason. But our view is that while that is absolutely correct, that isn't gonna get us anywhere in terms of trying to do things that will get women education. Um, one of the things that we're encouraging, and there's been a, a, a start in Germany, although I'm not sure how far it's gotten, is distance education. Uh, most Afghans do have access uh, to uh, an internet and, and television, thanks to the brilliance of Ashraf Ghani when he was Minister of Finance. He developed a circuit in, uh, uh, around uh, the, uh, Afghanistan that touched almost every major city and, and many rural communities. And that uh, it allows us to do something helpful. And the Deputy Minister Babri, or, or now Professor Babri, uh, since he's he, he had finished his term as deputy minister and the deputy minister really ran higher education and the minister did political things like going to meetings of all the other ministers, uh, really ran the whole higher education system. And during the time I was there, we produced two strategic plans for higher education, one in 2002 and the other, I think it was 2007, but I'm not, I can't remember for sure. Uh, there were, by the time I left, there were 400,000 students uh, in higher education. 30% uh, were women, which is quite remarkable given the problems. Uh, the most, the early graduates, as I said, were all people who had had their secondary education someplace other than, Af than at Afghanistan. And, you know, we, we what amazes us and what we've been trying to get through to some to some Taliban and the deputy ministers, although he was he right after he finished his uh, term, he became again uh, uh, president of Kabul University, the biggest of the universities. Uh, but the Taliban decided he was troublesome and threw him out of the country with his family. Uh, uh, and he's now in Germany uh, where he's teaching uh, and uh, has a two-year scholarship from the German government to teach and, and do research there. 
So he's there with his wife and three wonderful children. Um, but he would, he would like to be in a place where he can do more for Afghan women, especially. And he and I are working on some, some options that might help. Um, you know, the current situation is not only grim because of the lack of education, but 54% uh, of, the, of, the, of the population uh, is, or 54% of children under five are stunted uh, and 34% are underweight. Now, if you know anything about that, in childhood, that usually causes a severe, depending on how bad it is, but it, it causes brain damage and very often severe. So that, you know, these are not children who are going to grow up to be particularly useful to the Afghan economy. And then, of course, there's the other side, and that is no nation can develop if 50% of the workforce uh, are not allowed to work. And there were lots of women working. I would say about a third of the women in the ministry, uh, the workers in the ministry were women and many in senior positions. Uh, there were large numbers working in government and in NGOs. And basically in a matter of a few days, they suddenly couldn't work, couldn't leave their houses. So I'm in communication with several of them and they're of course very frustrated and particularly the older ones are frustrated because they, they, their daughters are not getting anything beyond primary education. There are some efforts as some of you may know to have private schools for women much as they did in the previous Taliban era. era uh, there's a wonderful novel called The Sewing Circles of Herat, which some of you may have read. If you haven't, it's very, very much worth reading, which talks about girls' education in Herat during the first Taliban period. And what they would do is go to somebody's house with some sewing or knitting or something. And of course, that house happened to be the house of a school teacher and the teacher would teach them. And so many of them uh, did get enough preparation. Uh, I know in one small town outside of Kabul, uh, where we did some interviewing, uh, there were 11 uh, women who actually were able to pass the entrance exam in 2022 when the universities were open to women. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 2002. Uh, and uh, they had had a good enough education in these in these sewing circles. Um, the what we're trying to do is to encourage governments to support distance education, to and to assist faculty. Uh, the deputy minister uh, or minister for, former deputy minister. Uh, has been able, because he was minister, to continue contact with some people in, in the ministry. Enrollments uh, in higher education are down by 60%. Uh, and more than 30% of faculty members have left Afghanistan. And, you know, as sadly is the case, the best and the brightest have no trouble getting jobs elsewhere. Uh, but that means many of those left are, are, are not the best faculty members. Added to that, people who replaced people like uh, Usman Babare as, as, as uh, president of Kabul University and the other institutes are all now uh, sycophantic Taliban members, and many of them don't even have a high school education. And while universities are fairly are able to run fairly well without leadership, uh, the quality of education has gone down tremendously. Um, so what we're suggesting uh, is that uh, people and governments work with moderate Taliban. And some of you may have seen there was uh, some interesting PBS uh, interviews with several people in Afghanistan uh, who were Taliban and, and they wanted to get women 
into secondary and tertiary education. But unfortunately, the Taliban leadership uh, is opposed, and that's a huge problem. Um, but you know, these people do recognize that Afghanistan can never move forward. And, and, for, and furthermore, they've lost a, a lot of their smartest and brightest administrators and leaders. There were many women doctors. There were a large number of women lawyers. And although the women lawyers even then had some limitations, I asked one of the most famous women lawyers in the last year I was there if she would be able to sue uh, in the courts for the fact that the company that she worked with was discriminating against her in the sense that her salary was one third lower than males doing exactly the same job. And she said, if I went into court with such a proposition, they would laugh me out of the courtroom. So, you know, even in that period, uh, there, there were limits. But on the other hand, there were many women in, in high positions uh, in higher education. So, you know, we're working with some with several people. Uh, the, the German effort to set up uh, higher education by distance has not been very successful. Uh, and uh, I know there are a couple of other attempts, especially for secondary students. But, it, you know, it is a major project. Anyone who's been an administrator, as I have at a university in the United States or anywhere else uh, in the free world, knows what a challenge it is to be department chair or a dean or a president of a university. And those are multiplied many fold, plus the amount of money available to higher education has decreased substantially. About 90% of the funding for higher education at the time I left came from donors, the World Bank, uh, USAID, that was which paid for the project I was involved in and I was working full-time uh, in the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, helping write policies, including we prepared a uh, a policy for gender equity, and we implemented it, uh, and a sexual harassment policy, which was implemented, um, and, and we were feeling very good about the progress with women. Unfortunately, uh, a few days before I was to come to the U.S. on leave, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education and the Ministry of Interior discovered a plot to kidnap me. Uh, and, and they discovered it on the day I was to be kidnapped. Uh, so I was put under tremendous guard. There were 12 people with AK-47s guarding me. And I was taken to the airport and to a special terminal, theoretically for VIPs, but there were only like four of us in, in that terminal and I, and I left. And uh, as uh, Usman Babri, said to me, we, we correspond weekly, but at the time he said, you know, we would love to have you back, but the Taliban always get their man. So I'm not gonna ask you to come back. And then of course he was thrown out of the country for being troublesome. And, and what was troublesome was that when the Taliban demanded, you know, they originally promised to allow women uh, into the universities, but they insisted that the women be taught separately from the men. And, and he tried to initiate that. <coughs> First by building partitions so that women would sit on one side and the men on the other and the teacher at the uh, stage. But that didn't satisfy the Taliban because the teacher, most of the teachers were in fact male, uh, about 23%, if I remember correctly, of the faculty members in Afghanistan were women by that time, which of course is a major improvement. And part of the problem with getting women teachers, even in that at that point, was there were no graduate programs in Afghanistan until toward the very end. And the first two were in Dari and Pashtu, uh, which would not have been our choice, but uh, was decreed. Um, 
So, you know, the situation is getting worse rather than better, as we saw last week with the banning of women from working, even for the UN. And the, the, the situation with food is terrible. Uh, and it is hard to know. I'm not sure this cutting off all the funds uh, for, the tal for, for the Taliban is necessarily a good idea. We are providing some funding through NGOs, but not very much. And I, I, my feeling is that there should be a, a beginning of releasing some funds to the Taliban on, with certain conditions. Uh, and if they meet those conditions, then a little more is released so that there's an incentive. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but we are working on that. And Professor Bob Ray, particularly, who has very good ties with people in education and, and actually with a few people in the Taliban. So I, I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, hopefully, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions when that time comes. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayward. Um, what an incredible experience. Thank you for sharing your personal experience and um, a little bit about what, what you're thinking is now in terms of the possibilities, but also for reaffirming how grave this situation is currently and how serious it is. And, you know, we do, we have lost serious, serious gains um, that, that have been made over the, the past 20 or so years, certainly since I've been um, working there ongoingly. So it is, however, um, comforting that there there are now technological you know technology is kind of on our side so we do have certain you know this on our side and that's something that certainly that we've been discussing on how do we address the brain drain issue and make sure that this isn't just leaving when people leave the country and that you know how do you design a program that can actually feed back to the country so this is something that right. um we've been discussing in depth and i think we'll we'll, ma we'll maybe talk a little bit about that in the dialogue sessions um but um, for now, um, just thank you so much um, for, 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 for that, for, for, for speaking. And um, I'd like to now um, move Dr. Um, Habiba Sarabi for our next um, speaker. Um, briefly before I, I would like to just say, if anybody has questions, please, um, we will open the floor to our speakers after, after, um, after this section of the dialogue, after this section of the webinar. But please do pop your questions in the chat so we can have a record of the questions. And then we will invite you to, if you to ask them in person, to um, turn on your video, raise your hand, and um, and um, ask your question to the panelists. So we will be keeping a record of the questions in the chat as well. Um, so, um, without further ado, I would now like to introduce Dr. Habiba Sarabi, and yeah. delighted to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Sarabi, Dr. Sarabi. Um, Dr. Habiba Sarabi is a hematologist, a leader, and a politician. She served as the Minister of Women's Affairs as well as the Minister of Education for the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, and she was appointed as the first female governor of yeah. Afghanistan and served as governor of Bamiyan province for eight years. Um, she was also a negotiator and advisor uh, for the executive directorate of Afghanistan's government. And Dr. Right. has received, received numerous awards, such as the Malali Medal for the former president of Afghanistan, right. Karzai, the Jason Award from Children's Square, Ohio State in the, in the United States, um, the Commander Medal from the Government of France, the Environment Champion title from the Times Monthly Magazine, um, the Rom Roman Mag Sasai Award from the Philippines, and the right. N-Word from the United Nations for her tireless work to bring peace to Afghanistan and for her focus on gender and women's empowerment. Um, so today, uh, Dr. Sarabi will speak to us about solutions and approaches for providing new and empowering educational opportunities um, for Afghan students. So Dr. Sarabi, I will hand over to you and thanks again for, for being here with us. Thank you very much, Eva, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, good morning and good evening to all uh, friends that they are watching us and uh, listening. So thank you for inviting me for this uh, very important discussion, which is uh, today for Afghan women, especially it's very crucial and important uh, uh, to discuss about the education and resolve how to strength, uh, the, how to re resolve the problem and how to strengthen women inside Afghanistan. Uh, 
so, um, of course, uh, I uh, very enjoyed from all this uh, presentation and uh, uh, all information that uh, uh, Professor Heward uh, gave to us. But in addition to, uh, to that, I want to add that uh, Afghanistan is the only country that uh, um, legally women are uh, women and girls banned from education. Uh, you cannot see any other Islamic or non-Islamic country that were, uh, girls can be, I mean, uh, banned from education and women from work. So this is uh, nowadays uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is uh, like a open prison for uh, uh, for women, uh, unfortunately. And uh, day by day, the situation is uh, getting worse. Uh, and any type of, of engagement and dialogue and and nothing can be uh, i mean uh, nothing work with uh, with taliban they are like a rock that anything that if you can uh, push or or beat them no it's not working i don't know but anyway uh, we have a saying uh, that uh, the peak of the mountain uh, as much the peak of mountain will be high, there will be a way uh, to reach to the peak. Um, I hope that one day uh, we can find uh, a solution that uh, how to work with Taliban. Uh, but coming to education, I want to um, uh, to uh, to talk about uh, or uh, to brief you uh, some part of ban that uh, Taliban. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, brought or, or gave it or release for uh, for uh, women in Afghanistan. As of January 31st, 2020, uh, uh, the Taliban have issued 20 decrees uh, uh, related to education with focus on the following uh, uh, part. Ban on co-education. This is one of the ban or the decree that they issued. Ban on secondary education for girls. Inclusion of additional religious subject in school curriculum, because Taliban brought some more, I mean, uh, uh, subject for the, uh, the school curriculum. Uh, and they think that the curricula is not a kind of Islamic curricula. Uh, ban on five uh, study major for female university student, journalism, law, veterinary, agriculture, economy. Uh, women or girls were not, were not allowed to go. Ban on mixed gender faculty meeting. And if, of course, every faculty had the meeting, but it was a mix uh, between the uh, female uh, professor and also uh, uh, men prof professor, but uh, Taliban banned that one. Ban on female inclusion on the annual university entry exam. This, it was another ban that they brought for uh, women. A distraction on, on female lecture entry to the university campuses. So these were t this, these uh, uh, 20 decree that uh, it was especially for, uh, for education. Of course, totally it is 100, uh, 110 decrees that Taliban uh, uh, released and out of this 110 or even uh, uh, 12, 90% uh, of them, or uh, 98 of these decreases uh, about uh, 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 women's rights, tackling or, or, uh, or tackling on women issue. It's, uh, it's it this uh, <laughs> creature of God. Is the, these these are the people that they want to, everything. They want again. They they want to show something against women. Uh, so I don't know what is the mentality, but if uh, about we can talk about mentality, it will take a lot of time, and there is another chapter that we have to talk. And the, I mean, <clears throat> and the researcher and also the policymaker should think about that. Why the Taliban are like this? It's another chapter that uh, should be uh, uh, think and uh, should be written about that and analyzed. Okay. Uh, in this uh, chapter, I want to uh, um, uh, talk about the, uh, I mean, some way how to, of course, uh, this is not a, 
the uh, permanent solution, but how we can strengthen women inside Afghanistan with this situation. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things that a professor also mentioned is the um, uh, education on dis uh, distance or online education. The uh, uh, women, uh, Afghan women in diaspora, they started some uh, sort of this education uh, from Europe, from uh, US, um, I mean, uh, England also, there are women uh, from uh, diaspora that they uh, provided some program, uh, online education. One of the program, uh, I'm even involved with that. I, I am uh, co-partner with a French NGO that they are doing the uh, online education, but uh, I'm partnering with them with the peace education. Unfortunately, Afghanistan always suffering from peace and, uh, and uh, uh, why the Taliban uh, came to the power again because of there was not reconciliation process there. Uh, uh, the, the healing uh, mechanism didn't work in Afghanistan. That's why Taliban again came to the power. So it's another long story. This is something that I want to do with the uh, uh, peace education with that program, which is the online program. Of course, there are some problems uh, still with this online program, but uh, we have to think about that. For example, internet is one of the biggest uh, problem that everyone in Afghanistan uh, uh, doesn't have access to internet and the device of course uh, uh, many people has the smartphone but uh, anyway and this education needs a little bit uh, a bigger device like uh, a laptop or, or, or uh, 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 tablet or anything so these are the power power is or electricity is another problem uh, so uh, unfortunately uh, afghanistan had uh, the electricity came from the it was uh, i mean it came from uh, uzbekistan and uh, and afghanistan didn't pro uh, produce electricity for themselves that's why it's cut off sometimes and it's a big problem and during the winter it was a big problem for afghan people Okay, when it, we, talk, we talk about this online education or distance education, there is another uh, uh, thing coming, uh, coming, which is the uh, teachers. So when we, uh, uh, when we uh, work with the online program, the teacher training is the other uh, uh, issue that we have to tackle with that and teach the, uh, the uh, teachers or train the teachers that they have, they can, uh, uh, they can work with this uh, online education program. So uh, this, the third one that I, I I want to talk about that already there uh, there are some organization started this online uh, uh, online program. Some of them they they are uh, going very well and the result is very good. So supporting that uh, uh, organization that they already started this online uh, program and that online program can be expand to uh, to different other uh, provinces for example many of the these organization or these uh, uh, people from diaspora uh, focusing on kabul herat or big cities like mazar and, and some other but uh, uh, if we can uh, spread it or, or expand it to the other province as well Providing scholarship is another um, another thing that or another solution, and it, it can be the of course uh, I'm not very um, um, I'm not agree with this neighboring country because for example Pakistan providing some scholarship but the, uh, our uh, the situation of our people in uh, in Pakistan is very dire it's really very and they are in a very uh, uh, bad condition at this moment. So this uh, regional country might be another uh, solution, for example, Kazakhstan and Bangladesh, Malaysia, or some other country that at the region, it's, it's also, excuse me, <coughs> My apologies. This is uh, this is something that can be possible to work with. 
uh, well, of course, the, this is not the only this, I mean, the, I mean the permanent solution. The permanent solution the, is, is to open the school and the university for the girls. Still, we are lobbying for that. I'm a part of this advocacy forum in New York and, and doing all the, the work with the policymaker and the state member. But this is something that uh, at least, for example, the first time of, of the Taliban era, uh, and, and I was involved with this uh, education program. Uh, I was in Pakistan at that time and had some sort of um, uh, a separate school uh, in Afghanistan. When uh, the Taliban, I mean, the new government came, it was accelerating education started in, inside Afghanistan. And the people who studied a little bit, they went to the acceleration program and got the, their degree. So beside the education program that I uh, mentioned about, uh, uh, and I talked about some, some program, uh, this crucial business that uh, uh, Professor and Dr. Yunus talked about that, it is really, really very interesting for me. At this moment, the women uh, inside Afghanistan, the only, I mean, solution and the only window that they can work and feed their their children and family you know that we have a big number of widow and women that they are running their family without any male member so this is the social business they are starting some small uh, business in afghanistan is, is starting from um, uh, i mean um, kitchen gardening from tailoring from embroidery different type of of these sort of uh, social business the social business is really interesting for me. If we, if we can focus on that, it will be a solution. And also, not only uh, the women can have some income, it's about the, this uh, uh, psychotherapy is also it's because it's a part of psychotherapy because women come together in a center and talking and, and sharing their, their pain, their grief. And so this is a, uh, can be a uh, part of psychotherapy. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for having me with this uh, very, very interesting and uh, empowering program. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sarabi, for speaking a little bit about uh, some of the some of the practical challenges as well with the distance and online learning education on the ground, but also, as you say, you know, the opportunities um, um, for social business for for employment. Um, so yeah, it's it's great to have you here, and thank you very much for um, for your for your. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so what I suggest is we will move to our final speaker and then we will open the floor for questions and dialogue but if people are interested in staying on for an extra 15 minutes perhaps we might um, continue the, the the dialogue um but um before we uh, before we move to this part of the webinar I'd like to the final speaker Dr. Avas Basir who was the former minister of higher education in Afghanistan and before um, joining this post he worked as the director general for the South that South Asia of, um, environment program and he also worked for the government of Afghanistan as the senior to the Afghan president on natural resources and environment deputy uh, director general of Afghanistan environment protection agency the chief of staff from the vice uh, president FIS, um, and the director for the cultural relations office ministry of foreign affairs and as a on environmental law teaching both at master and undergraduate levels um, he holds a PhD um, and uh, on international environmental law and currently works as advisor to UK South Asia and Night program under UK RI GCRF um, South Asia Nitrogen Hub and today will speak to us on the role of higher education what nations should do to help strengthen and augment higher education efforts and students in and outside of Afghanistan so thank you so much Dr. Basir for being with us today. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, your introduction. Also, thank you for uh, Dr. Sarabi and Dr. Farid for their uh, very insightful remarks. Uh, 
good morning and uh, good evening to everyone who have joined this uh, meeting. So first of all, I would like to thank Sustainable Smiles and the UNOS Center at the Asian Institute of Technology for their interest in Afghanistan education and organizing this virtual meeting at this very critical time. So using this opportunity, I would like to have a look into the past and then we'll be looking to the current situation and finally we'll be having some suggestion on the way forward. Uh, of course, uh, uh, both uh, uh, previous speakers uh, spoke about uh, the previous uh, achievements that we had during the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Of course, at that time, uh, uh, from 2001 to 2021, the education system in Afghanistan improved significantly. In terms of uh, uh, quantity, as uh, uh, Dr. Fred mentioned, so as of June 2020, there were uh, about 172 higher education institutions in Afghanistan, uh, out of which 39 were uh, public and 128 were uh, private universities, higher education institutions. So this was a, a, a great achievement. Uh, so in, uh, in 2020, at the time that I was uh, uh, working for the ministry, uh, 53% of the total student population of uh, 400,000 400, uh, and uh, uh, so students were enrolled in private universities and uh, institutions, while 46% uh, were enrolled in public institutions. It means that the, the majority were in the private so this was uh, uh, a huge development in Afghanistan compared to pre-2001 era when we had only uh, nine public universities and less than 8,000 students all over the country. This was in terms of quantity, in terms of uh, quality education also, we have uh, 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 done many, many, we did many progress, many steps were taken to improve the quality uh, education in uh, at Afghanistan. Uh, as Dr. Farid mentioned, there were two uh, strategic plans already implemented. We were working on the third strategic plan, uh, uh, third strategy, which was uh, a very uh, uh, um, innovative, uh, I believe. Uh, so, uh, uh, the uh, reemergence of Taliban as the governing force, uh, of course, has, has, has put all the achievements related to education and resources. So it has created uh, the concern among the people and, in particular, among the scholars and scholars and students. Uh, uh, just uh, I wanted to highlight some specific points in this regard that what is the current situation, what are the facts in the current situation. Uh, as we are running the short of the time, so I'll be more brief. Uh, so as, Dr. As ba Basir, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can I ask you if it's possible to speak a little bit closer to your mic because we're having a little yeah. bit of trouble hearing you? Okay. So Thank you. Great. May, may, maybe there is a problem in uh, my mic. So now, have, have is now, that's okay. Yeah, Much better, okay. thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the first uh, uh, problem that we are facing with is the brain drain. Uh, so I'm not going to speak about this uh, much because uh, already mentioned by Rich. Uh, so during the last two decades, uh, the human capacity of Afghanistan education system was improved significantly. Most of the professors and teachers uh, were at the PhD or master's level, having knowledge, knowledge and experience of Western countries. 
So after Taliban came to power, uh, so my information shows that more than the half of the professors and lecturers have left or are leaving the country. So uh, uh, the country's uh, universities in Kabul and beyond, such as Kabul University, Herat University, and Balkh University, are badly affected by brain drain. Uh, so the educated class is leaving the country. They are likely tough policies and religious related to regulation related to higher education by the Taliban. So this is one problem. The second problem is the uh, uh, academic uh, freedom. So of course, academic freedom is not uh, a problem. It is, but now. Uh, uh, Taliban are working on this to, to, to limit the academic freedom in the country. Uh, uh, Taliban has already uh, demonstrated that they will not allow subjects they perceive to be in uh, contradiction with Islam and Sharia to be taught. So, uh, uh, it is uh, said that Comments that, that the comments have been made by the Taliban about removing or changing some some of the academic subjects and education fields that are not in line with the Sharia. Especially, action has been taken to cancel courses received to uh, cancel the courses perceived to promote westernization and democratization in the in the country. So uh, you, may, you, you may hear that music classes are already removed from the Faculty of Art in Kabul University and others. Musicians and art groups are also removed from society. So they shut the doors to uh, their education, university, schools, and everything related to music and art. Uh, uh, so those who had worked in music and art and invested their lives in the field so were removed from the center. Uh, the third uh, issue is the female access to education. It was addressed by the other speakers as well. I'm not going to go through. The most uh, uh, other important issue is uh, uh, sport, radicalization of higher education in Afghanistan. Uh, so, the uh, Taliban continue uh, uh, with, uh, with their agenda of Islamization of the country's education system. Uh, so it means that even if Taliban agree to reopen the universities for women and girls, so there are will justify concerns that Taliban reopening of the universities will simply create more opportunities for radicalization and the teaching of Taliban orthodoxy. Uh, so Already, the Taliban have increased the national requirement of classes focused on Islamic civilization from one or two, depending upon degree, to 24. These courses are replacing other vital courses in this in all disciplines. The Taliban have all ordered uh, or, uh, have ordered that every district have a government madrasa. So, if the situation continues like this. But Khalism will be having more chance to spread inside and outside the country. The universities may become the new breeding ground for radical Islamic militants, where the next generation is trained and formed. They will learn a, a very distorted view of Islam, where hatred is permissible. Jihad allows to murder the murder of innocent civilians, including other Muslims, Muslim men, women, children, and the new. Heroes of uh, 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 heroes are of Jewish. So this is the, the thing. So uh, 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 I am mostly afraid of this situation, and uh, so I, I, I have discussed with many that this uh, situation will be uh, uh, deteriorating Afghanistan and uh, as well as uh, uh, regions security. Uh, uh, fifth is the r risk of private higher education, uh, uh, private higher education institutions closure. This is uh, another problem that we are uh, uh, facing. So uh, 
as, as mentioned, Afghanistan uh, has had about uh, 128 private universities across 24 provinces with around a total of uh, more than 200,000 students. So half out of this, uh, about 80,000 uh, uh, students were women. So th this was a great achievement for Afghanistan. Uh, uh, but uh, now, due to a high rate of uh, unemployment, and particularly after the ban of uh, 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 ban after the ban on female students, all of these universities are at risk of closure. Two of the private universities are already closed. Uh, one is the uh, uh, Afghanistan University, which was in, in, in Kabul, it was already closed, and one other university in Bal in Balkh. So and. Uh, uh, 35 others uh, uh, announced that if the Taliban continue to ban female from higher education, they will also have to shut. So this is uh, the situation. So, uh, what are the way forward? Uh, so uh, 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 the same as uh, uh, previous speakers mentioned. So uh, uh, I have. Uh, 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 this kind of uh, suggestion for way forward, so providing more scholarship programs for ed education and research, both education and research for students and scholars. So I, I'm I, I'm here in G in Germany. I'm in contact with different universities in Germany and also with the uh, political authorities to provide uh, opportunities for uh, our scholars. Because the hundreds of scholars uh, now for. They are, they are residing in Germany, uh, but they are jobless, they are not uh, working. So th this is very important that we provide such kind of opportunities for these uh, scholars to do their job and, and uh, integrate them in the higher education systems. Uh, 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 the second is the online, online education. Uh, of course, we have a good experience of online education in Afghanistan, Zoli. There is a problem of uh, the lack of electricity in the country. Uh, but uh, at the time that uh, we were in Afghanistan, we were working on uh, uh, online education system. So uh, the, the, uh, uh, we could find different ways to overcome challenges that we uh, had at that time. Uh, and now also we can use such kind of uh, experience. Uh, uh, so supporting higher education institution is uh, some safe countries uh, uh, so provide fun for students and researchers in Afghanistan's uh, 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 neighboring countries uh, and regions such as Thailand, Pakistan, and Turkey, as mentioned by other speakers also. Uh, of, of course, bringing all Afghan students to UK, Europe, and US and other countries is uh, 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 is not a simple task. Uh, regional universities are often uh, easier alternative for advanced than US and uh, education institutions. So this this is this is one option. Uh, the uh, other option is providing scholarship for those who are in Afghanistan and desire to do their education from private universities. This will help the students to continue their education. And at the same time, support the institutions to survive. This is the, uh, this is very important uh, issue that I, I'm in contact with those uh, with some of those universities and uh, also with the uh, uh, with their association. This is their demand that if there is some opportunities to provide scholars for for uh, students in those universities, it would be helpful for students and results for. Uh, uh, Institutions. So uh, uh, the most important issue is that we should develop leadership program so to prepare the young Afghan generation for a post-Taliban era. I, I'm very happy that uh, this program that we are we are discussing today about so it, it has also a, 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 an opportunity for Afghans. To, to de develop uh, a job instead of finding a job, 
they, they empower students to develop, create job in Afghanistan or outside of Afghanistan. Uh, but the developing leadership programs is also one uh, a very important initiative that we can uh, consider. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, these are my suggestions. So, so I, I'm in contact with the uh, universities. I mentioned I have also uh, sent a, an open letter to uh, Prime Minister of uh, uh, Germany and also an open letter to uh, uh, Secretary General of the UN. So, so I have raised these points in that open letter also as, as a solution. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, Dr. Sarabi mentioned, this is not uh, a permanent solution. The permanent solution is that we should convince Taliban or change the government. Uh, 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 of course, the, Dr. Parit mentioned that we can work with Taliban to change their mind. Of, uh, uh, I mean, this idea that you know, they did not be changed. It, it's not possible to change Taliban's point of view. Uh, uh, we, 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 we need to work. Uh, uh, change the, the, the authority, change the, the government with the support of Af, Af, uh, Afghan people and also with the support of uh, uh, international uh, community. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jasir. Um, thank you very much for, for that. I think you raised some really key points on can do practically the scholarships for students, but also some of those intangible skill well, leadership kind of leadership programs. And I think that's where, you know, this program is specifically is very powerful and very potent is that, you know, there are those practical skills, but then so the, the leadership skills and the soft skills that go behind, but behind actually making change and being an agent for change are just as important as those opportunities that are so crucial that you mentioned. So thank you for, for bringing that, that leadership to the discussion. Um, so I think now what we will do is we'll turn to the audience and ask if our participants have any questions for panelists, and then we will, um, we will open the floor to have a, a, a brief dialogue and discussion. Um, so if, if, if you would like to ask a question to the panel, uh, we would appreciate if you could put your uh, question in the chat first of all and raise your hand and the option either to, to turn on your video or leave it off. Um, but um, okay, so I see we have one hand up and it's Dr. Mohibi. So Mohibi, do you have a question for our, for our panel? Welcome. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for very nice informative presentations and in talking about higher education in Afghanistan and women education in Afghanistan. As I really enjoyed this uh, information. Uh, my question is for, I think for four of the, uh, our uh, guest speaker. And uh, you mentioned that online education and I have a concern about online education or distance education. And when you are talking about distance edu education, there is one issue. One is the assurance of distance education or online education. And the second is the recognition, recognition of the uh, certificate, who will recognize, who will assurance the certificate of online education and who will accept then if they are want to work in Afghanistan, they have to have uh, acceptance from the government. And that, that is my question. Thank you. And we want to learn this one uh, to, uh, to add in our program. Uh, Dr. Dr. Hayward, I believe you're the question, but I think you're on mute. How's that? Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, on the question of, of certification, uh, the distance education would be certified in whatever country was listed as the host country. So if it was run out of Germany, it would be German certification or the US, US certification. And as long as it was a major country with a recognized higher education system, it, it would surely 
be accepted anywhere as distance education is now. Uh, part of the problem, however, it is getting enough people together to offer the various courses, and they would have to be offered both in Dari and Pashtu, since uh, and you know a lot of people like me who would be happy to offer a course can only do it in English or I can do it in French, but that doesn't do much good. Uh, so there is the language problem, but as as several of us have noted, there are a large number of Afghans who have left 30% of the teaching faculty uh, have left the country. So I think it would, and they would be easy to recruit to do something like this. Thanks, Robert. May I have something in this regard? Yes, please. Yes, Dr. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, this is this is uh, a good question. So I'm also faced with such kind of question many times. So the recognition is very important. Uh, uh, there are different solutions for that. One is that we establish uh, uh, a separate uh, uh, mechanism, a separate virtual compass for online university. This is one solution, of course, it, it, it requires a lot of money. So a lot of uh, infrastructure. And, and the, the, the other solution is that in each country, under each uh, 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 university, we can establish such kind of program. If, if uh, universities are helpful, so they can establish such a kind of program uh, uh, only for uh, Afghans, uh, so even they, they, they can have other other students from other countries as well. Having such a kind of platform in the uh, uh, universities, it would be much helpful. So I, I'm in, in this case with uh, Cologne University, Bonn University, and some other universities, that if, if there is any possibility for them to establish such kind of uh, 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 mechanism platform under their umbrella. So it means that while some someone is graduating uh, uh, from uh, uh, Ireland course, so Bonn University will be uh, giving the certificate. This this is another solution. I may. Uh, yes, please, Dr. Sarah. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's uh, and Dr. Basir said it's very, very important and crucial uh, question. Uh, the, I mean, certificate. Of course, you, uh, the the of course uh, uh, fu is doing it's it uh, they will do it uh, through the qatar and georgetown university but it is very important that if the certification is is coming it should be after a, a kind of re, uh, evaluation if there is no monitoring system the certification will not uh, i mean will not work uh, maybe the UNIS center can do that but it can be through the uh, evaluation and also through the a kind of monitoring system, which is very important. Thank you, Dr. Sarat. Um, if there are no more answers from our panelists, yeah, may, uh, may, may, I, may I add one, one point? Oh, yes. I, uh, yes, sure, please, uh, Dr. Of Sarat. course, th 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 there was a, a problem at the time that I was working for, for Minister of Education. So according to Afghanistan uh, uh, established regulation, so, uh, online education was not uh, recognized. So, uh, we were trying to change the regu regulation because due to uh, uh, COVID-19, it was necessary to change such kind of regulation. So uh, uh, there is a need to, for this also to, to overcome, overcome this challenge. We should consider this. Thank you, Dr. Basir. 
Um, I think now we have two questions from um, two of our friends. So first we have Hossai Zormati, Halim, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And then we will take a question from the Akbari. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody so much for putting this effective uh, seminar together. Uh, I loved the fact that uh, with your all ability uh, as uh, Dr. Sarabi, uh, Dr. Basir, uh, and of course, uh, Professor Hayward, and uh, Professor Franklin, all of you joining together to collaborate in this platform, regardless of what it's happening. Uh, it's, it's an excellent resistance form right over here is the form of education that is taking place. And uh, my question just goes back to probably uh, Professor Hayward. Uh, it has to do with a couple of the things that you had raised, uh, a couple of factors that you had raised within uh, your um, speech or dialogue. And it has to do with uh, goes back to the aid and providing some kind of a platform for this negotiation to occur uh, with the Taliban to make sure that uh, some form of an effective uh, institution is literally uh, grown on the ground. I think uh, local involvement has a lot of power uh, starting locally and um, a method of even contributing or taking their ideas of catering through something simple as going even to the local mullah that teaches us over there and persuading that individual through some form of negotiation and it should be done by women. Do you see any perspective for that to work? Um, well, as far as local involvement, I think that isn't very hard because many of us still have contacts in various local areas. Uh, and, you know, I get regular emails, you know, asking me well, what's happening with distance ed education and so on. And unfortunately, I, uh, it's not there yet. And, and my preference, by the way, on distance education would be to start with secondary education first and then move on to higher education, though in some ways higher education might be easier. I mean, I've been involved with distance education in the United States in a joint effort uh, with the BBC. Uh, and with American higher education. And I know how difficult it is, even when you don't have the kind of complications all three of us have, have mentioned. Um, but I, I think it is possible. And I know that there are some equivalents of the so sewing circles in Herat already uh, in, in place. And I think it will expand. I think, uh, you know, the, the key for starting it is going to, to, to have a setup in some country. And, and as I said before, I'm not worried about the, the, uh, the equivalent of accreditation. I mean, I was, was deputy director of the accreditation, uh, Central Accreditation Bureau in the United States, and we accredited distance education. So, I mean, if this were to be you know, it can come from all over the world as we are today, just talking to each other. But if it's registered in the United States or Great Britain, both of which have very good accreditation system, it could be accredited. And, and I think the point someone made earlier is it is, is very important that it be quality. And this is, this is something that those of us who are trying to help are totally committed to. On, on your women's point, it'll be very hard at the moment for women to be involved because it's, they're so restricted in their ability to travel. And even traveling with a man, you know, you're not allowed to go to public gatherings or anything. You can go to the grocery store if you're accompanied by a man. So, and, and just the fact that they've last week cut out employment for women with the UN is, is, is moving in the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you so much for your response, Dr. Hayward. And um, Sweeta Akbari, you, are, you have had your hand raised next. And if, you, if you're asking a question on whether it's to our please introduce yourself. And if you would also like to introduce your organization or where you're coming from, that would be appreciated as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much, first of all, for uh, inviting me and giving me an opportunity to join this important dialogue. Uh, I, I would also like to thank the um, Honest Center and Sustainable Smile and also the Holling Center for supporting such a dialogues about the higher education system in Afghanistan. 
Um, uh, yeah, my name is Svita Akbari. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Afghan Women Scholars, which is a new organization uh, found uh, 2022nd uh, in March uh, in Finland. It's registered and based in Finland. I'm also doing my postdoc research at the time in Finland at Tampa University. Uh, yep, uh, I have been and ground up in Afghanistan, and I have always seen such problems in Afghanistan for education in uh, women and uh, girls. But um, I have also seen that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Fred mentioned about the, um, the online uh, courses or um, the, uh, online systems for education of Afghan female students in Afghanistan maybe uh, could be used in the local language or maybe in English language. But I have in here uh, something, just a suggestion and also a question from Mr. Fred that uh, in our organization, uh, basically when we contact uh, universities for the support of uh, Afghan women scholars, um, rarely we receive response from universities that they are eager to um, uh, support uh, the application or provide any invitation later for our female scholars from Afghanistan. But the big, big huge problem or the huge problem is that uh, they always ask the same criteria that they ask for other international students. Uh, the language is the most important uh, thing that we cannot introduce our uh, scholars to universities abroad. Uh, what do you think that the, should we go for further internationalization of education in Afghanistan? And that's the uh, could be something that can help our scholars to leave the country and continue their higher education abroad. We know that in most, uh, we have Dr. Uh, Abbas Basir, and my respect to all of you, and to Dr. Basir, Abbas Basir as well. Uh, I have been working in Ministry of Higher Education as a former as a, uh, academic advisor for a short time in 2019. Uh, and, uh, we have seen that uh, women education uh, um, a problem. Uh, uh, in Afghanistan since years, but uh, yeah, the education has not been supported internationally. Like they cannot get much of the scholarships and maybe other opportunities due to language uh, problems. Uh, so, what do you think that should we go for uh, further for language training and uh, the or something else? My another question is like uh, we know that education cannot wait. Uh, that's the thing that we cannot give time for education. Uh, uh, most of our uh, scholars in Afghanistan, they are seeking for uh, careers outside. Um, uh, unfortunately, they don't have any uh, time, like um, any opportunity or any facility, especially in science and engineering, to continue their research uh, inside Afghanistan. What do you think, like, uh, will it um, affect their career uh, in applying for jobs overseas, academic jobs, I mean, postdoc positions or other? I'm one of them. I lost five years of education. And nowadays, when I'm applying for some of the uh, scholarship uh, or maybe fellowship for my postdoc uh, research, uh, I find like um, it's very common that people above 35 or maybe one month above 35 cannot apply for many of fundings. Who will actually bear this uh, gap? Like uh, who will uh, accept this gap that we have lost it due to the Taliban being 20 years ago? So. Uh, it would be appreciated if you can have some uh, response for this. Thank you so much. I, I, I wish I, I had something that I could give you a magic bullet or something. It, it is a problem, and, and certainly in the United States, um, I've written lots of letters of support for people to get visas. It depends on what country you're in. I mean, you're in, in Finland, I think you said. Now, I mean, it, it's in some countries, in Finland is a good one. It's much easier to get a, a education visa uh, to the U.S., but you do have to be admitted first to a university. One university that has, I would recommend, has already has a lot of Afghan students, is the University of Massachusetts uh, at Amherst. They they led the, the the project I was involved in was funded by USAID and the World Bank through UMass Amherst, and they have been involved with Afghanistan for more than 30 years. And what they've done with the overhead money that they get from these uh, grants is use it to support Afghan students. So two of the people who worked with me and in the ministry are now finishing up their PhD, and there's several other Afghans there. So 
that's one place you might start. Uh, and I would start early. I don't know how far along you are. You doing your dissertation now? Um, I'm doing my postdoc here. Are you yeah. asking have you, about, have you, you haven't had, started your, your dissertation yet? Uh, no, I already completed my PhD actually in Malaysia. Oh, okay. uh, oh, I'm see. doing postdoc research, uh, uh, and my background is chemical engineering. I'm a chemical right, right. engineer. Uh, but uh, right. Do you know much of uh, Hedda uh, yet? Uh, no. uh, he's an Afghan who is there and, and has been helping people. Uh, if you'll send me an email, my email address is Hayward Fred, H A Y W A R D F R E D, at hotmail.com. Send me an email and I'll give you a couple of names of people you might contact. Thank you so much, Professor. Actually, the problem, the issue is about all the Afghan women. It's not only about me. Thank you so much no, for no, your suggestions. I'll... I really appreciate it. And uh, that's the concern that I see lots of people usually you're in dialogues with international, nationally and locally in Afghanistan, maybe. So that's just uh, one of the issues that you could uh, raise in, in uh, during those uh, dialogues that uh, this is something that should be considered for Afghan scholars and um, for every Afghan who has lost a year due to the um, restrictions yep. and uh, education. And that would be very appreciated. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, we have something? Please, yes, yeah. Dr. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Akberi, for, for uh, your comment and your question, of course, you, you raise a very uh, uh, important point. Uh, language is a barrier for education. Uh, having uh, uh, learning, language learning, um, education is very important. Uh, so we can consider this issue in our discussion as well. Uh, um, if we are not able to overcome this barrier, it would be difficult for us to uh, uh, utilize the opportunities that are available all over the world. This is this is one one thing. The other issue is that uh, there are already established program for uh, 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 international competition. While we are talking about Afghanistan opportunities, I'm I'm not talking about this. That's already established programs. And as as, as uh, 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 Akbari mentioned, it is it is very difficult for many Afghans to uh, uh, be successful in uh, uh, participating at this competition. The most important issue is that we should establish a very specific program for Afghans. Uh, uh, we should work with the countries if they are willing to support Afghans. So they, uh, if they are willing to support Afghan, uh, Afghanistan, they. Uh, we need to have such a kind of specific uh, scholarship program, program for Afghanistan. We already had different kind of exchange programs, collaboration programs uh, with uh, different universities all over the world. But nowadays, it, all of them are stopped. All of them are stopped. There's, there is no universities have coll uh, collaboration with Kabul University or other universities. So uh, uh, we need to have uh, such kind of uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, scholarships for programs. Uh, and as, as I already mentioned, uh, having uh, fellowship programs for uh, scholars is, is very uh, important vital for us. Thank you, Dr. Brasir, and thank you, uh, Suita Akbari, for your questions. I think we have questions from Rafiuddin Najam. Thank you for joining us. And then I think we will open briefly out the questions that we would like to ask our attendees open briefly out for, um, but we're. I'm hoping that we will close up in about um, 
10, 10 minutes or so. So thank you for being patient. We're running over time. I really appreciate everyone being here with us today. And hopefully we will be running these daily sessions ongoingly. So we will get better at our timekeeping and also um, we'll make sure that we allow you time for discussion um, at the next one. So I, I do hope everyone will be able to join us. Um, uh, Rafiuddin Najam, please, please go ahead um, with your question to the panelists. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, everyone. This is uh, Rafi Udin Najm. I'm a PhD candidate in public policy at Oregon State with focus on education uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, more, more than a question, I have two areas that could be potentially utilized to improve the effectiveness of programs and uh, such discussions. And what would, one could be the uh, that you and the center can take a lead on increasing coordination between all different initiatives that has been taking place nowadays uh, to assist Afghan students. Uh, most of most of them do not have uh, like a capacity to target everybody, but if we bring all of them together on one table, then we, we are more likely to reach uh, people beyond. Uh, and secondly, uh, the pandemic has taught us that we can think out of the box and there could be some alternative options. And I think that might be one short term solution for Afghanistan situation at this time that we can use those interventions. Uh, but that does require some sort of negotiation and starting point, as Professor Howard mentioned, that we need to engage in, in talks and open those channels that we can convince them, if not the conventional, the traditional way of teaching that we are uh, in lecture and that we used to in Afghanistan. But what we could do is to utilize these new intervention through pandemic, both in Afghanistan and other developing countries uh, that has been implemented. And there's a lot of them uh, we're, we're, that could be a short term solution. Uh, that we can use to reach a particular Afghan woman in these uh, difficult situation. Uh, and that's all for me, thanks. Uh, you make a, a very important point about coordination. One of the things that I didn't mention that Professor Barbara and I uh, are suggesting in this paper is that there be a coordinating committee made up of Afghans and internationals who are who are interested because you're absolutely right. There isn't any coordination at the moment. And, you know, somebody like Professor Barbary particularly is keeping track of everything he hears about, but, you know, there's a limit. And I think having a coordinating committee with people from a variety of different countries that have been active in Afghanistan or would like to be, that's an excellent point. Thank you so much, Rafidin Najam. If no one has um, uh, any response to, to this, this suggestion, thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, we will move on to the final piece of our dialogue, actually, where we would like to put um, a question to our attendees. Um, and we would really like to open the floor for um, some input and suggestions and feedback. Um, and I think that was a, a nice comment to kind of segue into to this, uh, you know, how can the international community help strengthen yeah. education efforts for Afghan students? And the second one question that we have is, you know, all can social business and entrepreneurship play in fostering social action on the ground in Afghanistan, support um, the development of partnerships um, in Afghanistan. So really two questions that we are getting some feedback from our participants on supporting with the design of the program that can best serve education efforts already underway in Afghanistan, but also best serve people who are already doing work on the ground um, in that, that is in relation to social business um, effort. Um, so we'll open the floor now, and if you have um, a comment or would like to participate and um, get involved in the program and the development of the program, suggestions for us, would like to continue um, the, the discussions further, the dialogues, um, put your name in the chat um, and or raise your hand and uh, feel free to, to, um, to speak. Uh, now. So thank you everyone so much for being uh, with us and sharing with us as we've gone a little bit over time as well. Much appreciated. Excuse me, uh, uh, Franklin. Uh, so yes, I, Dr. I, I, 
I have to uh, leave the meeting because uh, I have another program. And so I should be sure. prepared for that. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. And much for your contribution today and for, for, for your presentation. It's much appreciated. And we really, yeah, we appreciate your, um, your being with us today and contributing to this, to this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I will be in touch. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, 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 I'm interested to cooperate with, with the other and uh, uh, Dr. Pais, uh, uh, Sukhari and uh, many others who, who are interested to work with uh, uh, Afghanistan people and on Afghanistan education. I'm re really interested to continue my contact if there is any possibility to do something for Afghanistan. Uh, so I, I'll be hearing from Dr. Muhibbi when the meeting finished, but what was the result of this? What, what was the conclusion? Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, Goodbye, Dr. Basir. Thank you. So we have um, Muhammad Ali Fi. Um, if you would like to unmute, you have a question or a comment. I see you had left a comment in the chat earlier. Much appreciated for that. Perhaps it is in relation to, to this, but please, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Franklin. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can yes. hear you perfectly. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, uh, I would like just to add two points. First of all, uh, it was a very good conversation and suggestions regarding how to support, especially the female students uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I, as you see in the chat, <clears throat> I think there are a great demand for higher education uh, among the uh, female students. But uh, if we would like to prioritize considering the, uh, uh, the limited uh, <clears throat> Uh, the limited uh, opportunities and at the same time resources, uh, probably uh, those uh, students who are in the less in the, in the less latest stages, uh, latest stages of their studies, for example, in the last semesters <clears throat> that could be supported. Uh, of course, I'm not representing here UNESCO, but I would like to add some uh, some information here in this panel uh, in this webinar. Uh, uh, recently, uh, we have established a, uh, an e-learning center here to support female students in Kabul. Of course, there are some challenges here because this e-learning center should be, uh, should be <clears throat> recognized by the de facto authority that it, uh, that it has not uh, uh, to, uh, taken place yet. Uh, but on the other hand, these e-learning centers that provided some opportunities online uh, uh, facilities for the for a limited number of students have been so far successful. This has covered uh, uh, some female students who are uh, uh, who are in last semesters of their studies here in Kabul. And the second point that I would like to add is that uh, currently, recently, uh, the development partner group uh, in Afghanistan have established a uh, higher education working group. Today uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, the, uh, the last meeting of the uh, education development partner groups. That's a <clears throat> group that uh, uh, this, uh, there was some uh, discussion about uh, this working group in for higher education. It is in fact a coordinating uh, platform uh, to identify those partners who are involved in <clears throat> provision of higher education, supporting higher education in Afghanistan, and at the same time uh, to, uh, to coordinate different efforts and identify the gaps, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, especially <clears throat> in, uh, for the females' access to higher education and uh, what can be done. So I think at the moment, there is this platform in Afghanistan, and uh, of course, it would uh, uh, it would uh, also cover those <clears throat> uh, partners that are uh, out of Afghanistan as well. They are, but but they are supporting the students here. So I think um, uh, probably those who are interested to work in Afghanistan or support students in Afghanistan probably they can join 
this uh, working group as well. The condition for joining this working group is not necessarily to be uh, <clears throat> to be uh, in the part of the uh, partners who have a physical presence in Afghanistan. All of those who are supporting higher education in Afghanistan, they could be part of this uh, uh, working group, or at least uh, you can share the information of the programs that you, you are offering for the students in Afghanistan. It would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very important suggestion of what happens if people are in transition, being able to finish out their degrees in yeah. online settings. I think it's such an important point you raised and also um, connecting in with the uh, King Group and the coordinating um, committee as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, and yes, I would like to open the floor again. Any final, um, final maybe yeah. comments from our participants um, I think we will wrap up in, in about five minutes. So yeah. appreciate everyone for um, being with us. And if we have um, if we have any additional comments in in relation to our questions, what what can we what um, how can the international community strengthen efforts um, in Afghanistan for Afghan students, um, education and role can social business and entrepreneurship play in fostering social action and partnerships in Afghanistan? Um, I think uh, we have two. Sorry, Franklin. Again, uh, yes, please. Yes. Up. Yes. Uh, one point regarding to the recognition or uh, whatever it is said technically about the online program in Afghanistan. I think it is important if uh, uh, if these uh, uh, these degrees should be recognized in Afghanistan at the moment, especially for for the females. But at the moment, I think uh, this would not be a very, very uh, critical issue because the women in Afghanistan, they are not able to work or they are not uh, able to enroll in any graduate programs. But uh, this online program, if it is recognized by the host universities, could open an opportunity for those students to continue or to extend their graduate programs uh, in other countries abroad. So I think from this point of view, it is very important because this this was uh, discussed in details in Afghanistan within the development partners group. And uh, as far as I know, uh, so these online uh, degrees are recognized by many international universities. Therefore, it could be a very good opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and Rafia Din Najam, did you have a cover? Uh, yeah, question. just just a quick uh, just a quick suggestion that could be utilized uh, as Dr. Uh, everybody mentioned that utilizing Afghans that uh, are outside or inside the country, uh, in particularly uh, students like me who've been through uh, several years of education abroad and has uh, the experience of uh, let's say intensive training and research or certain part of skills. That could be utilized in terms of mentorship, both for students who are at the uh, unit center uh, up there, and as well for uh, students who are in Afghanistan and trying to engage and stay connected with students abroad. That could be another dimension that could be utilized in order to, uh, because like if I'm if I'm if I'm connecting and talking, mentoring, uh, and have a mentee and working with that one person, I I feel more engaged in that my increase cooperation. And if there is such a platform that could be easily utilized, I know a lot of students in Afghanistan, I came through Fulbright scholarship for my master's, like there are hundreds of us. So if everybody try to ripple and increase that, I think that will scale up uh, some sort of mentorship. It won't help with the degrees, but at least it will help them to stay connected and, and utilize some open sources to continue their education and curiosity. Yeah, thanks for that point. It's something that we had talked about extensively as well. And he has an extensive Afghan alumni network too. So, but I, I like the idea of really broadening it out to the very wide network of, you know, Afghans, um, you know, in, in, in institutions all over. So that is something, you know, really way, a really good way that we could partner with universities globally um, and expand the uh, alumni network. So yeah, excellent suggestion. Thank you very much for that. Um, and Dr. Feist, did you have anything to say on that point as well. Right. Thank you. Uh, well, I just wanted to 
uh, say that the Unis Masters at uh, AIT has hybrid uh, modes as well. In fact, our only Afghan student at the moment is a young woman who started uh, studying overseas uh, because she had to wait for visas in a way to exit the country and then had to wait in Pakistan for her Thai visa and so on. So all this time, which was almost a semester, she was taking classes regularly and she's now uh, facing herself as the other students are. So, so we have that, uh, and it's a fully recognized degree. It's a globally recognized program. So as, as we've heard before, uh, things have moved on and there is much more acceptance of this kind of hybrid uh, degree programs than, yeah. and uh, we do understand that employability within Afghanistan uh, will be uh, an issue, which is exactly why this program is not preparing people for jobs. It's preparing people for livelihoods and leadership. So I just wanted to reiterate that. And I think that's a great question as well. So thank you for that, Mr. Najib. Let, let me add something in response to an early question that I meant to mention about language. I do think it's important where it's possible to encourage the teaching of English um, even in, even in France, which has been the biggest holdout, uh, you can take courses in, in English. And it, it is the most common language in the countries that have high quality higher education. India, another example. Um, so I, I, I do think that among the things we've talked about, it's important to, to also consider English language instruction. I just pitch in there as well and say that we have a language center that uh, has a bridging program. So uh, people can admit be admitted, but they can't graduate until they at least make a 6.0 on the IELTS. So there are modalities in place as well, and I'm sure there's other universities uh, that have very similar programs that can encourage this exact uh, thing that you point out, Professor Hebert. Great. Thank you, Dr. Feist. And um, Dr. Mohibi. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, as before, uh, also Minister uh, Basir mentioned that uh, we need specific program and also there was a uh, few other people, they mentioned that we need a specific program. But I think this program, which we are talking right now about with the AIT and also uh, sustainable smile uh, the current program which uh, designed is really specific by their own and it's very kind of flexible and that will support the uh, students and as dr Faiz mentioned there is a bridging program which is the language center which i did that the, my english and that language center when i was a student there during my uh, uh, master degree uh, but uh, I think this is very unique and, uh, and specific uh, for uh, supporting the Afghan students. And on the other hand, uh, I was thinking to ask uh, everyone, uh, the panelists and also uh, the, part the participants, how you can support uh, our program. And, and uh, if you could give advice or uh, any connection uh, that will be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, Mohibi. It's um, it, it is certainly why we were one of the reasons why we were doing that. We we really wanted to hear from our participants on their ideas and their thoughts, and if they had you know wanted to collaborate with us on this. So I think it is something that we can certainly um, uh, follow on with. So uh, uh, Kelly, perhaps you can pop your email in the chat if. If, so continue the the dialogue and the discussion, and if there is anyone who wishes to be, you know, to be involved, knowingly, please um, please do reach out to us, and we'd be happy to 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 speak with you. And and we are looking for collaborators, and um, so yes, um, much appreciated. Um, if um, if you would like to be um, involved continuously, so I think um, I think that leaves us to a close now. Yes, doc, as Dr. Kelly has said, she will follow up um, 
uh, uh with with all spence um about the about the webinar um we do have a series of webinars and thank you so much to the holiday again for supporting this series of dialogues um the next dialogue um the next few dialogues, we will be looking more in depth at the specific kind of key leverage points or key key areas that kelly had mentioned in um, leverage points for afghanistan um from you know women in 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 tech to sustainable food systems wastewater energy management and looking at um, social business opportunities uh, there in those areas, which we feel are a very significant, um, not we feel, but which are a very significant environmental, social and economic um, importance and looking at the crux of, 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 of those issues and what are the, the opportunities and the leverage points there from a social business perspective. Um, so we, we will follow up with all the participants on, on, the, on the date of that next web. And just to say a huge thank you to all of our esteemed speakers, Dr. Fred Hayward, we still have you with us, but also to Dr. Sarabi and Dr. Sahib. Um, and all of our participants, Dr. Feiss, uh, Dr. Kelly Franklin, and Dr. Mohibi, who have been so crucial in the development of, of this program, this special scholarship program. And um, it's really a, you know, a, a testament to that we can, you know, collaborate uh, from from all these different places in the world on 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 a topic so um, so so necessary today, which is supporting, um, you know, the continuation of higher education in Afghanistan. So, um, I. I I look forward to the next webinar. I hope we will have everybody in attendance and, and more. And um, yes, thank you again for, for being with us. Um, well, thank you very much for organizing and coordinating this. It's, you've done a wonderful job. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Hayward. And wherever you are in the in the world, have a lovely rest of the morning, afternoon, and and evening. And again, to the diversity of countries and nationalities we have represented in the in the room. So yeah, it's wonderful to be here with you all virtually. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.